Neutrons, they were first discussed in school when learning about the structure of the atom, right? Mass number minus atomic number equals the neutron number. This makes them nucleons, so building blocks of the nucleus. And today we are going to talk a bit about neutron radiation and free neutrons. Specifically, first the introduction of our neutron source and other neutron sources. Why is neutron radiation so dangerous? How do we measure it? How do we protect ourselves from it? And even more information about neutrons. So, down there is our neutron source. Here's the best picture of the free neutron source during renovation work. For radiation protection reasons, it's not justifiable to pull it out entirely just for a picture. Why? It's a americium beryllium source. Inside the capsule is likely a mixture of americium 4 oxide and beryllium in the powder form. Today it contains roughly 65 gigabecquerels of americium 241, which is about half a gram. Basically, you need a very active alpha emitter and beryllium. In this case, americium-241 with a half-life of 432.6 years emits 5.5 mega electron volt alphas at beryllium. From beryllium-9, an extremely excited C13 compound nucleus is created. This is not comparable to normal carbon-13. This compound nucleus emits a neutron and turns into carbon-12. In a reaction equation, you would describe it like this, as an alpha-N reaction. With the americium beryllium source, you get about 70 neutrons per second per megabecquerels of alphas. The same would work with polonium-210, where you would get the same number of neutrons. And if you used radium as an alpha source, you get about 400 neutrons per second per megabecquerels of alphas. It works with several other alpha emitters as well, but there are other neutron source types that generate neutrons for example via a gamma N reaction. You could irradiate deuterium with 2.23 mega electron volt gammas or beryllium 9 with 1.67 mega electron volts, but there is also a variant that runs on antimony 124. You irradiate a mixture of natural antimony 123 and beryllium powder in a reactor. Breed antimony 124 and this isotope has gamma lines with more than 1.67 mega electron volts which can trigger the gamma N reaction described earlier. However, it's only moderately cool because you first need a reactor to make the antimony 124 and the neutron source decays with the antimony 124's half-life of just 60 days. You can get quite creative with this as long as the gamma energy is high enough. For example, sodium 24 would also make a great neutron source. Or you can just use californium 252, which undergoes significant spontaneous fission releasing neutrons as a result. Please do not confuse neutron sources with neutron generators, okay? So, how strong is the beryllium americium source with 65 gigabecquerels of americium 241? You could calculate it. 70 times 65,000 megabecquerels is 4.55 million neutrons per second. The neutrons emitted here are fast neutrons. For most nuclear reactions require neutron irradiation, thermal neutrons are preferred. Thermal has to do something with heat. And heat is just on an atomic level, nothing but movement of atoms. At room temperature, all molecules wobble a bit. This includes the oxygen molecule in the air. And thermal, in this context of neutrons, means having the same kinetic energy as the surrounding atoms, which corresponds to a kinetic energy at 20 degrees C room temperature. For neutrons, this means a kinetic energy of 0.025 electron volts. And how would you slow these fast neutrons produced by the alpha N reactions down? Through elastic collisions, ideally with a light atom, because the momentum transferred is better. And the lightest atom is the hydrogen atom. This is why we use paraffin, which essentially is a solid collection of hydrogen atoms, consisting also of carbon-hydrogen chains. Here I have a ping pong ball representing a neutron, and this wall is a heavy atom, like lead. Yes, the momentum transferred is basically zero. A piece of paper representing a hydrogen atom moves much faster and a neutron loses its energy. Neutron radiation is dangerous for two reasons. First, like all radiations in nuclear chemistry, it's ionizing radiation, so you can damage genetic material. It has a radiation weighing factor five times higher compared to beta or gamma radiation. But even worse, it can make things radioactive. This isn't an issue for the average person or even a nuclear chemist, but generally speaking, alpha, beta and gamma radiation destroy materials. For example, the radiation damage to resin from radium. 
but a neutron radiation can hit nuclei and turn them into long-lived radionuclides. Concrete can eventually become radioactive itself. That is not a problem for the average household, but for nuclear power plants, where the concrete is exposed to such a high neutron flux, that it really becomes a significant issue. The flux there is up to a billion times higher than of our neutron source, and I already find ours quite scary. So how do we measure them? Why is that even a question? Just hold up a standard detector, right? No, it will detect something, but this is not the neutron dose rate, but it will measure the prompt gammas that are always produced with a neutron source. I'll cover that in a separate video. Neutrons simply do not interact strongly with matter due to their lack of charge. They don't interact with the electron shell, only with the nuclei, which is, as we know, very tiny in terms of volume. So they need to be measured indirectly. One way is via the N-alpha reaction in boron. 96% enriched boron-10 in the form of gaseous boron trifluoride is contained in a proportional countertube. When a neutron hits the boron, a nuclear reaction produces lithium-7 and an alpha particle, which then can be measured. Or you can use spectrometric measurements, it's usually done with a liquid scintillation counter or a hydrogen-filled proportional counter. I already showed how momentum is transferred from neutrons to light atoms and these recoil protons can then be measured. The pulse height relative to channel resolution is about 10% at 1 mega electron volts recoil protons. We have a Bonner sphere. It consists of several moderator spheres surrounded by copper or lead layers to increase the response to neutrons above 20 mega electron volts and inside there is a helium-3 probe. The extremely expensive helium isotope is there under about 8 times atmospheric pressure. When a neutron hits it, tritium and hydrogen form, which can then be detected by a gas filled detector. The nice thing is that tritium decays back into helium-3 and we only measure the protons from the nuclear reaction. So what about the neutron dose from our neutron source? Already at the door frame you can measure a neutron dose rate of 0.04 microsieverts an hour. Background is zero for neutrons. The average background neutron flux is one neutron. Where we briefly stay during irradiation, there is about 3 microsieverts an hour. And directly above the hole there are 22 microsieverts an hour. For science, let's pull out the neutron source and measure a quasi-contact dose rate of pure neutron radiation. It comes out to about 1 millisievert an hour just from neutrons. Off camera and with a bit of tweaking I got up to 1.5 millisieverts an hour and of course I've never touched the source directly. 20 millisieverts an hour from prompt gammas comes in addition to that but this is just because we don't have devices that measure higher. Now that we know we have neutrons, how do we protect ourselves from them? In practical radiation protection it's called first moderate then shield. So use paraffin or similar until the neutrons are well thermalized and then shield them with for example lead. Lead is cheap and due to the high density offers many large atoms in relative to a very small volume, increasing the likelihood of interactions with thermal neutrons. But won't the lead eventually become radioactive then? Neutron capture cross section is very low but yes over time a tiny amount of bismuth will form which is very long lived. The best shielding for thermal neutrons is cadmium. It has a very high absorption cross section for thermal neutrons. Fast neutrons will go right through them, but thermal neutrons are pretty much completely shielded with just a few centimeters of cadmium. More facts about neutrons. Free neutrons have a half-life of 10 minutes. That's also why cosmic radiation never consists of primary neutrons. Even though the sun as a fusion reactor emits extremely many neutrons, they all decay into protons via beta minus decay due to their half-life on their way to the earth. Some of these newly formed protons will definitely absorb the 781 kilo electron volt betas to form hydrogen, but that doesn't happen that regularly only in small parts. The specific activity is 6.739 times 10 to the power of 11 gigabecquerels per gram. That's a piece of information that hopefully never finds real world applications. A special thanks goes to the working group of analytics and fundamental nuclear chemistry from Dr. Erik Strupp and the division of nuclear chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my Patreons. With that being said, thank you for your attention and goodbye.